This kind of approach is kind of the way some students approach preparing for standardized tests. In order to get test scores to go up, teachers will end up teaching to the test. Now, that approach can work, test results often do go up. But it fails the fundamental goal of education, to prepare students to succeed over the long term. So given these obstacles, what can we do to transform the way we transform organizations? So rather than being exhausting, it's actually empowering and energizing. To do that, we need to focus on five strategic imperatives, all of which have one thing in common, putting people first. The first imperative for putting people first is to inspire through purpose. Most transformations have financial and operational goals. These are important and they can be energizing to leaders, but they tend not to be very motivating to most people in the organization. To motivate more broadly, the transformation Now, why are companies embracing the re-entry internship? Because the internship allows the employer to base their hiring decision on an actual work sample instead of a series of interviews and the employer does not have to make that permanent hiring decision until the internship period is over. This testing out period removes the perceived risk that some managers attach to hiring relaunchers and they are attracting excellent candidates who are turning into great hires. Think about how far we have come. Before this, most employers were not interested in engaging with relaunchers at all. But now, not only are programs being developed specifically with relaunchers in mind but you can't even apply for these programs unless you have a gap on your resume. This is the mark of real change of true institutional shift because if we can solve this problem for relaunchers we can solve it for other career transitioners too. In fact, an employer just told me that their veterans return to work program is based on their re-entry internship program. So then begs the question, what if we cover the entire desert with solar panels? How much energy would we actually be able to produce and how? Would this change our planet? Let's take a deep dive. For starters, let's begin here. This is the Where's That Solar Power Station in Morocco, the world's largest concentrated solar power plant currently in existence in a marvel of modern engineering. Once fully completed and operational, the plant will take up an area of 25 square kilometers and be capable of producing 582 megawatts of electricity. It will even be capable of storing solar energy in the form of superheated molten salt, which allows for further production of electricity even into the night. After investing more than $9 billion into their solar energy objective, Morocco aims to create four additional plants similar to this one in the Sahara that will collectively create more than 2,000 megawatts of electricity production which will be enough
and and is pretty stupid. It doesn't have much a brain, no will, no plan, and yet, many ants together are smart. An ant colony can construct complex structures. Some colonies keep farms of fungi, others take care of cattle. They can wage war or defend themselves. How is this possible? How can a bunch of stupid things do smart things together? This phenomenon is called emergence, and it's one of the most fascinating and mysterious features of our universe. In a nutshell, it describes small things forming bigger things that have different properties than the sum of their parts. Emergence is complexity arising from simplicity, and emergence is everywhere. Water has vastly different properties to the molecules that make it up, like the concept of wetness. Take wet fabric, if you zoom in far enough, there is no wetness. There are just molecules sitting in the spaces between the atoms of the cloth. Wetness is an emerging But for these things that we actually do really care about and do experience profound regret around, what does that experience feel like? We all know the short answer. It feels terrible. Regret feels awful. But it turns out that regret feels awful in four very specific and consistent ways. So, the first consistent component of regret is basically denial. When I went home that night after getting my tattoo, I basically stayed up all night. And for the first several hours, there was exactly one thought in my head. And the thought was, make it go away. This is an unbelievably primitive emotional response. Mean, it's right up there with, I want my mommy. We're not trying to solve the problem. We're not trying to understand how the problem came about. We just want it to vanish. The second characteristic component of regret is a sense of bewilderment. So, the other thing thought about there in my bedroom that night was, how could have done that? But if we're to ask you a similar question, what percentage of the population do you think is capable of truly mastering calculus, or understanding organic chemistry, or, or being able to contribute to, to cancer research? A lot of you might say, well, with a great education system, maybe 20, 30 percent. But what if that estimate is just based on your own experience in a non-mastery framework your own experience with yourself or observing your peers, where you're being pushed at this set pace through classes, accumulating all these gaps? Even when you got that 95%, what was that 5% you missed? And it keeps accumulating all the way you get to an advanced class, all of a sudden you hit a wall and say, I'm not meant to be a cancer researcher, not meant to be a physicist, not meant to be a mathematician. I suspect that that actually is the case, but if you were allowed to be operating in a mastery framework, if you were allowed to really take agency over your learning,
As a speech language pathologist and as a multilingual mother of bilingual children, I am finding myself shocked and confused at the number of parents I run into who have chosen not to speak their native language to their children for various reasons or who have been persuaded to believe that speaking their native language to their children will hurt them socially or academically if the primary language of the community is different. So why should parents talk to their children in their native language? The first and simplest reason is that it is the language in which they are likely to be most dominant or proficient which in turn is the language in which they are able to provide quality language input as well as support effectively and consistently. Even if a parent is able to pick up the language of the community, that parent's vocabulary, grammar skills, and ease of communication will probably remain stronger in the native language. You could argue this kind of digital detox would be beneficial. We'd take our eyes off our screens then strike up real-life conversations with each other. We've discovered that our smartphones can actually make phone calls. We bring back fax machines and start making notes by hand. Well, maybe not fax machines and hey, we'd still have TV to entertain as the world would not fall apart. In fact, with almost 4 billion people having no access to the internet worldwide, half of humanity wouldn't notice a difference in the short term. But not you, mighty internet user. You would notice right away. If the internet suddenly flatlined, social media users would start calling each other on the phone overloading the working telecommunication systems, unless cell phone towers and telephone lines were also shut down. Then you'd go back to writing letters and sending them via post. Forget about wireless file transfers with no Wi-Fi. Sometimes ignorance is preferable to the detailed truth. Maybe, we only care about truth in so far as it empowers us, knowing and thinking about all of the details of every orange tree would just be a psychological burden for the most of us. I'll take illusion over the reality, but can't help but ask, is it possible that the mind is actually accessing a deeper kind of truth? Maybe, the mind is separating the signal from the noise. But what constitutes signal versus noise? Our values. A farmer that values knowing all the details of an orange tree will view it differently than a regular person. Well, where do our values come from? Here's Nietzsche's view from beyond good and evil, behind all logic and its seeming sovereignty of movement, their two stand valuations are, more clearly, physiological demands for the preservation of a certain type of life. For Nietzsche, our values come from our physiological demands,
I understand your professor has been discussing several Eastern Woodland Indian tribes in your study of Native American cultures. As you have probably all learned, the Eastern Woodland Indians get their name from the forest-covered areas of the Eastern United States where they live. The earliest woodland cultures date back 9,000 years, but the group we'll focus on dates back only to about 700 AD. We now call these Native Americans the Mississippian culture, because they settled in the Mississippi River Valley. This civilization is known for its flat-topped monuments called Temple Mounds. They were made of earth and used as temples and official residences. The Temple Mounds were located in the central square of the city, with the huts of the townspeople built in rows around the plaza. The Mississippian people were city dwellers. But some city residents earned their living as farmers, tending the fields of corn, beans, and squash that surrounded the city.